Peter Kremlin, live on Sky News Australia. Good evening and welcome to the show. Here's what's coming up on the program. Former ABC journalist Stan Grant's latest rant takes aim at Senator Jacinta Price as he labels the country cold-hearted and uncaring for rejecting the voice. Appalling journalism from the nine papers who describe the brutal murder of a young Jewish woman by Hamas terrorists as simply a case of being caught in crossfire. The ACT's new euthanasia laws, described as the most liberal in Australia, with critics warning that the removal of all life expectancy requirements will open the gates to state-sponsored suicide. Plus, more pro-Palestinian protests erupt in the Melbourne CBD. The group is threatening more disruption if that's what it takes to get their anti-Israel message through. It needs to escalate to any level it needs to in order to stop Australia's support of the slaughter of innocent Palestinians. We are not going to stop. They can expect a lot more disruption across Australia. But first, you know the Anthony Albanese government is in strife when even the most left-leaning polls show Australians are seeing through the empty promises and ineptitude. The latest Guardian Essential poll was released today and The Guardian did do its best to bury most of the data and I'll show you why. If this polling is accurate, then Airbus Albo needs to reassess his government's faltering agenda. Now, among the interesting results is the dive in both Labor and the Greens' primary vote. Labor falling from 33 to 32%, while the Greens fell from 14 to 10%. The coalition is up from 32 to 34 per cent. One Nation, United Australia and other minor parties are all up as well. Now, also fascinating here is the gender breakup. Women are more likely to vote for the coalition than Labor. We are told the Liberal Party has a woman's problem, but according to the essential polling, that is not the case. When it comes to men, Labor and the coalition are tied on 34% primary vote, but for female voters, while 34% back the coalition, only 29% back Labor. And that's reflected in the all-important two-party preferred numbers. For female voters, the coalition is at 47%, Labor at 45%, with 8% undecided, while for male voters and overall, Labor maintains a small lead over the coalition. It begs the question, despite the uh, leftist media's bias, have female voters warmed to Peter Dutton and his coalition? Uh, Essential also measured the national mood. And I've got to tell you, it ain't good. You don't need to be told that with the cost of living pressures we're all grappling with. Only one in three Australians believe the country is heading in the right direction. Around half say we are very much on the wrong track and 18% are unsure. The data also showed there was strong support for nuclear energy with one in two Australians backing Australia developing nuclear power plants for the generation of electricity. Only one in three opposed now and the rest unsure. And the majority poll did not think Australia would reach net zero by 2050. I'll be speaking to Patrick Carline shortly about those polling trends. But before I do, I want to highlight a disturbing report from the Herald Sun into the hostile environment facing Jewish students at Australian universities. We know these are hotbeds of far-left lunacy nowadays, and that means that anti-Israel, anti-Semitic sentiment is often tolerated, some would say even encouraged. Suzanne Delabasic reports in the Herald Sun that Jewish students at Monash University have been offered separate rooms to sit their exams. Yes, we're segregating students now for their own safety. A letter circulated by students and seen by the Herald Sun said affected students would have the option to undertake an online exam or discreetly change rooms to sit tests elsewhere if they felt unsafe. Monash University said eligible students could also apply for special arrangements. 
And locally, we have seen pro-Palestinian, or should that be anti-Israel protests, cross the line with people intimidated and government buildings damaged. Tempers flaring at the top end of Collins Street with this noisy group of self-described activists targeting a DFAT office with paint and megaphones. Oh, we're here protesting DFAT support of Israel. We are Lunchtime diners and shoppers clearing out as the group moved inside Collins Place before a large police line ushered them out again. This passerby not as patient. Well, it's nothing to do with us here. I'm trying to walk up the street. I don't want these people yelling their hatred at me. At one stage, a Jewish man ran the gauntlet, giving back as good as he got. <laughs> The group then briefly blocked trams and traffic as they moved to Parliament, leaving behind a clean-up job. So they caused havoc in the CBD, blocking traffic, blocking trams, defacing buildings, writing defat blood on your hands at the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade Office in Collins Street. As you saw in the clip there, there was no shortage of police officers present and yet, despite the unlawful behaviour, including damaging a government building, there were no arrests. Victoria Police had no qualms about harassing old ladies on park benches or a pregnant woman in her own kitchen during Victoria's illiberal lockdowns. They were happy to chase kids off playgrounds and families off beaches. But when it comes to the usual troublemakers, they are reluctant to act. Let's head to Canberra now for tonight's political headlines with Sky News political reporter Olivia Kaisley. Good evening. Former Liberal Foreign Affairs Minister Alexander Downer says Anthony Albanese should urge Xi Jinping to persuade Russia to end its war with Ukraine. We need China um, to intervene as best China can to try to persuade Vladimir Putin that the war in Ukraine should come to an end. He also warned of broader conflict breaking out in the Indo-Pacific. It comes as the Prime Minister condemned Hamas's attack on Israel while expressing concern for civilians in Gaza. It's also important uh, to recognise that Israel has a right to defend itself, but how it does that matters. And we need to make sure as well that every civilian life is valued, whether it be Israeli or Palestinian. The Prime Minister says it's up to Paul Keating to explain why he didn't co-sign a letter condemning Hamas's attack. I don't think that's a question for Paul Keating, I would have thought. Um, I, I support the positions that, that I've taken. Israel has a right to defend itself, but how it does that matters. And we need to make sure as well that every civilian life is valued, whether it be Israeli or Palestinian. Six of the seven living Australian Prime Ministers released the statement on the Israel-Gaza conflict calling for the release of hostages and urging Israel to avoid civilian casualties in Gaza. The letter was brokered by former Treasurer Josh Frydenberg, but ultimately drafted by Malcolm Turnbull with contributions from the others. Former Labor Prime Minister Paul Keating revealed over the weekend that he had declined to participate. It's a reminder of uh, some of the differences we're seeing on the Labor side, and it's deeply unfortunate. Oh, that's up to him. Um... I think the letter's a useful addition. It just shows a, a, a unity of purpose in Australia between the main parties, and that's a good thing. So I think it's a useful contribution. The Albanese government has launched a $10 million recruitment drive promoting teaching as a meaningful and rewarding career. Because we want more young Australians to see this and decide to be that teacher, that teacher who changes lives. The ad aims to address the national teacher shortage by raising the status of the profession in the community. Pay's an issue, workload's an issue, respect is an issue as well. Uh, the fact is that a lot of teachers will tell you they don't feel like they're valued by our local community. We need to change that. 
another big news day. Lots to get through. Joining me now is senior writer and columnist at the Herald Sun, Patrick Carline. Patrick, welcome to the program. Hi, Let's start with the protest in Melbourne. We saw a little bit of footage of it. They targeted the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade in the centre of the city. They caused significant disruption. Premier Jacinta Allen was asked about the ongoing protest. She had this to say. And they're continuing to see reports of, of continuing to see reports of children, particularly in some of the most difficult set of circumstances, regardless of which part of the Middle East you live in. This is what they're being experienced right now. Look, she talked about anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. There seems to be this determination to both sides this issue, but it's the Jewish students who need their own safe rooms at university. It's, it's, it's the Jewish schools that have just had to up security to ridiculous levels. I'm not sure both sides siding this is sound. Well, Jacinda Allen is a new Premier, as we well know. She's been very cautious, I think, on October 8th, the day after the massacre in Israel. We, we saw her refuse to use the word terrorism to mm. describe it. And she's been very cautious. And I think, look, she's, she said quite rightly, it's her paramount job to make sure that the peace is kept. And I think she's been politically expedient in this case and sort of covering all bases. Um, that will offend some people in the Jewish community, I would think. Um, but she's cautious, cautious so far. She is very cautious and we're going to talk about this with the international panel later because I think Labor have got a problem right through their ranks when it comes to this issue. Now, right across the world, uh, journalists have questioned the severity of Hamas's terror attacks, including some at our own ABC. But today, gruesome footage of Hamas's militants uh, murdering hundreds of Israeli, uh, Israeli civilians was aired for a group of Australian journalists, marking the first time the horrific video, which includes body cam footage of Hamas terrorists, uh, being shown outside of Israel. Uh, it's shocking, Patrick, that this needs to happen, that there is still so much doubt uh, about what actually occurred on October 7, that they feel the need to show the proof, the brutal reality of what happened. Well, I'm glad I myself don't have to watch this video. Mm. It just sounds terrible, the, the sort of stuff that would haunt you for life. Absolutely. Um, and I think you're right, it is terribly sad. Um, we're seeing it across the Western world, especially universities, where uh, a massacre of innocent people has sort of been used as a, uh, as a default clarion call, if you like, mm. for, for change in the region. Um, and that's not right. You can't do that. It, th this was a massacre. It's not a starting point for change. Um, and I think it's really important um, that y you look at Israel's response to it uh, and you look at, say, the, the response to ISIS in Mosul in, I think, 2017, that was seen as a just war. There was 8,000 civilian uh, casualties uh, and 50 journalists, I think, died as well. Uh, Israel is not commanding the same sort of sentiment uh, and respect. And I think this, this is them saying, well, we, ne we need the world to understand what happened here. I spoke to one of the journalists who saw this footage um, when Israel showed it to 200 foreign press and he was in tears recounting what he saw. He, I, I think you're 100% right. He's going to be impacted by that for the rest of his life. You can't unsee that horror. Now, the PM has claimed that the failed voice referendum was never about him, only to then have a crack at his... Uh, counterpart Peter Dutton and former Prime Ministers for promising to hold referendums and failing to do so. Anthony Albanese also declared that we need to find a different path to achieve reconciliation. Patrick, he's still funding the Makarata, the Treaty Making Commission. Is that the new path? Is that the answer to uh, reconciliation? Well, we just had a referendum, didn't we? And six in ten Australians said no mm. to the questions. And part of that um, reluctance to to uh, support it was this notion that there was a truth uh, truth telling part aspect to the the voice that would follow that there would be a treat treaties enacted following that people were suspicious um, and people oh, I think every decent Australian believes in reconciliation um, they don't believe in looking backwards and sort of you know being forced to feel shame or guilt um, everybody wants better outcomes going forward and I think yes. just into price did a wonderful job of actually explaining. We need changes looking ahead. We don't need to look backwards. We just spent all year looking at the voice, <laughs> looking backwards. Uh, we're sick of it. We're fatigued. We want to move on. And we, 
everybody wants reconciliation, but this is not it. I don't think this is it. And like you said, the Australian people have spoken. It's unequivocal. It wasn't close. Yes. And yet we're going down this treaty making. Like, why are we having this when we know if you voted no to the voice, then if you were having a referendum on the treaty, it would be what nine out of ten voting no. <laughs> <laughs> the figures would be even uh, more emphatic. You mentioned Jacinta Price, former ABC journo and Indigenous activist Stan Grant. Uh, well, he's still emoting wildly um, and with some fairly remarkable commentary in a speech he gave. You also did have a veiled crack at Senator Price, describing her as the victorious politician who says this no vote puts an end to the politics of grievance and who waves away generational trauma as mere contrivance. Well, yes. And he also said the politician has no tolerance for history. Pain is negated by progress. Well... Pain is negated by progress. I mean, do we want to be always looking backwards and looking at the pain of our ancestors or do we want to improve outcomes right now and for our children? Well, I think, look, I mean, he, he talked about racism in his speech last night. I thought he got a, a few things very on the mark. He, he talked about this being a monumental change rather than an inoffensive, I think. Well, that, that's right. He yeah. said it wasn't, as Anthony Albanese claimed, a modest proposal. Yes. That was yes. interesting. But what I think of, I went up to some uh, Indigenous communities back in August up uh, in Cape York. They weren't talking about the voice. Mm. They were very cynical about the voice. They, a, a lot of them were you know, among the... I think it's 37% of Indigenous people actually voted no. Mm. Are we going to call them cold-hearted? Are we going to call them racist? Um, it's It's... Silly. And it is time to move on, really. Mm. Well, the electorates with the biggest Indigenous populations, the top five, uh, were emphatic no's, if that means anything. And interestingly, some of the strongest yes votes were for electorates, including mine, that have next to no Indigenous population, 0.2% in Goldstein, for example. So, yeah, that, that was an interesting trend. Now to the ACT and several legal experts from across the country, including the Law Council of Australia, have warned that... Um, no, actually, I'm going to go to Labor's misinformation bill first, then the ACT. Uh, Labor's misinformation bill, it's been described, Patrick, as dangerous for civil rights. Um, we've got barristers like Margaret Keneen saying that it's a threat to free speech. This looks like the next big national fight. Uh, are the coalition up to it? They've just had a victory with the voice. Uh, this mm. is going to be, I think, another one that is going to really energise their the coalition base. Well, you'd really hope that they're up for it because this is the, the wording of this bill is dangerous and it turns the tenets of, you know, uh, of, of legal practice uh, that, that, that have been there for hundreds of years on their head. Mm. Uh, if you're accused of murder or of rape, you have the, the right to silence. You don't have to incriminate yourself. Under these proposals, as they are, uh, and it all sounds very big brother, doesn't it? Orwellian in, in, uh, in, in the sense of media, uh, government media regulators who will decide what is misinformation and that they might have the power to coerce people to testify. Um, sorry, that, that just goes against everything. And you've got some, you know, very, very heavy-hitting legal bodies nationally saying this is wrong, this is dangerous, stop. It absolutely it is. And if we've learned anything over the last three years is that what's considered misinformation today is gospel truth a couple of, <laughs> couple of years later. I mean, look at all the things we were told during COVID about um, everything from wearing masks outdoors to vaccines, stopping transmission. Mm. And, you know, when you question that, you were, you were called... Uh, uh, someone who's spreading disinformation. Now, to the ACT and Dr Long, a senior research fellow at Charles Sturt University, is um, Australian Centre for Christianity and Culture. They're saying that the ACT's new euthanasia laws would be not only the most liberal in Australia, but would open the door to state-sponsored suicide. Uh, this is concerning, Patrick, because they're talking about getting rid of the life expectancy requirements that the other states have in place. Uh, what do you think? I mean, the, the ACT, the only state that voted yes for the voice, it is the most left-leaning... Sorry, not only state, only territory. It is the most left-leaning state or territory. 
this shouldn't be a surprise. Look, I, I think, I mean, the ACT was talking about considering letting teenagers... Um, uh, 14 year olds. 14 year olds. <laughs> um, that life expectancy uh, provision is built in for a very good reason. It, it puts checks and balances uh, on, on the ability to pursue, you know, an assisted death. Um, to not have those checks and balances, um, you end up using words like liberal and euthanasia in the same sentence. Uh, that's, that's scary. That is very scary. It is, and when you look at those better lux countries, uh, Belgium, Luxembourg, which brought in uh, euthanasia a long time ago, that slippery slope is real, folks, because they do mm. have state-sponsored suicide. You can have the state kill you for having emotional pain. You don't even have to have a life-threatening illness. Patrick Carline, thank you so much for joining me tonight. After the break, Terry McCran will be here to discuss the prospect of yet another interest rate rise on Tuesday. Plus, later in the show, I'll be joined by Pauline Hanson on what we can expect to see from her Please Explain series in 2024. Welcome back. Now, millions of Australians are doing it tough out there at the moment. Rents are up, power bills are up, insurance costs are up, the list goes on. But for those with a mortgage, the core concern is rising interest rates. And judging by the latest inflation and retail spending data, it's likely that next Tuesday, Reserve Bank Governor Michelle Bullock will hike again, which will no doubt make Christmas a lot harder for families right across the country. Joining me to discuss this and more is business columnist at the Herald Sun, Terry McCran. Terry, welcome to the program. What's your prediction? Will we we have a Melbourne Cup rate rate hike? Can I start with the Thursday prediction, which is the US Fed meets to make its decision on interest rates. We'll get the decision Thursday morning. Mm. I think that might provide some sort of a pointer to what the Reserve Bank does, mm. because I think ultimately the Fed will say there's so much uncertainty created by the events in the Middle East, this is probably not a good time to shock Americans with another rate hike. And I think that might be a cue to the, the Reserve Bank as well, that I think the Reserve Bank should not hike, even before the Middle East. I'm out on a limb on that front. Uh, most people think the uh, hike is locked in. But because I of the inflation. Because of the inflation figures, yeah. obviously. But I think this is not a good time to... We don't need a hike. I mean, as you've indicated, there's a lot of pain out there. People mm. are suffering. Uh, a, a hike will really add to that, obviously. We don't need it now. The Reserve Bank can take the time to really look at what happens through Christmas, how the Middle East plays out in economic and financial terms. You know, the, I'm not going to comment on the geopolitical and the human terms, but in, it, there's no need to rush to a rate hike on Cup Day, so I think the Reserve Bank should should not hike. However, Jim Chalmers has thrown his spade in, and I don't think that was very helpful at all. Why does he keep doing this? Well, it's because he's, I think he was trying to heavy Michelle Bullock into not hiking, uh, you know, and so there's a bit of a problem now that if she doesn't hike, she'll be seen to be kowtowing to instructions from the Especially Treasury. Especially when the market and many uh, economists are expecting a hike. Yeah. So it will be seen that way. I don't know why he feels the need to publicly state anything that could be perceived as putting pressure on yeah. it. But uh, th 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 some of this data does seem to be counterintuitive. I mean, we do know people are hurting, uh, rates are already biting. So why do we have retail spending data going up. How does how is that... Explain? You've got to be careful about over-interpreting those retail sales, Rita, that um, uh, month to month they can jump about. Mm. Uh, when I walk down high streets, I see a lot of empty shops still. Yeah. I think there's a lot of spending taking place in hospitality, but in terms of Harvey Norman, the, the, the core retail of hard goods and clothing, I think that uh, they're not exactly booming. So, again... Mm. It plays into this, my, my argument that you really don't need to rush to a rate hike. It's not like we're standing on the edge of an inflation volcano. And if the Reserve Bank does something on Tuesday, uh, it, all hell will break loose on the inflation front. Now, what's the latest on the critical minerals front? Over the last few weeks, we've had mining billionaire Gina <laughs> Reinhardt backing several Australian lithium mining companies. The United States, along with the Commonwealth Government, is assisting the development of several of Australia's critical mineral projects. This seems to be the start of a new mining boom. Well, let me say thank goodness for Gina, Rita, 
because she's the person that's got an interest in, in investing in these spaces. She's got the money to do so. And do we really want all the investment coming from China and or the US? Mm. We don't want to have their, throat, their feet on our critical minerals throat. Yeah. Lovely to see Gina going there. I give her a big tick and hope she succeeds. And finally, the ACCC's battle with Qantas. <laughs> Again, you are... You are uh, from left field on this one. We've had pretty much everybody just slamming Qantas. Right. But you're saying they've, they've got an argument Well, here. I, you know, I, we, I've been through exactly the same issues that everybody else has been through with Qantas, trying to get flights, finding them unsatisfactory, the website doesn't work well, and so on and so on. But very specifically in relation to give them a break for the difficulties they had when they were coming out of COVID, they had to deal with a really dramatically disastrous situation. It's just specifically on that. Well, come on. I mean, this nonsense <laughs> about, oh, we're not selling a specific flight, it's a bundle of sort of services. I mean, it doesn't work both ways. If I miss my flight, they're not going to go, well, you know, you bought a bundle of services, we'll just put you on another plane. That, but, it, it, it's but provided you get on a plane around about... At extra cost around, me. No, no, no. Well, it shouldn't be an extra cost. That's, that's... But I'm saying if I miss it, if, yeah. it, if, if it's my fault that the... Oh, I'm indeed, there, indeed, indeed. That bundle argument doesn't uh, come doesn't into work. play. Well, it works one way. Yes. It works my way. <laughs> um, well, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, thank you so much, Terry McCran. Appreciate your time. Now, I want to talk about our farmers uh, who are fed up with a green agenda that continues to make it harder for them to produce and to produce efficiently. Joining me to get the latest on our food producers' grievances is David Johinke, who is the new president of the National Farmers Federation. David, welcome to the program. You've come out strongly against Labor Energy Minister Chris Bowen and his energy plans. Uh, he wants to have these wind turbines all along the countryside, solar farms, transmission lines. Uh, tell me about your campaign. Well, Rita... At the National Farmers Federation, we've been surveying our members and hearing their concerns right down to the core of the key issues that are keeping them awake. And we feel in many ways that farmers are losing their land, we're losing access to water and we're losing access to our workforce through policies that aren't going to be conducive to ensure that we're more productive than we've ever been. So what we've done is we've launched a call, campaign called Keep Farmers Farming. And that's all about ensuring that we put all these policies forward as a package and that demonstrates that it's going to curve our productivity and that productivity curve is going to hurt consumers. So we talk about water, we talk about the buybacks that are proposed underneath the changing of the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. What we want to see is making sure that all of the environmental projects are exhausted before that happens. We talk about industrial relations. We want to have a look and investigate opportunities to get a dedicated pathway for for workers to come to farms from overseas and the current palm scheme is not delivering on the flexibility that we're looking for in agriculture and then finally with renewables farmers want to be part of renewables we host a wind farm here on our farm but we're not going to do it at all costs we want to make sure that farmers are consulted mm. making sure that we've got the strategy right be behind where these farms are going but then more so that the the pain that's being felt is not just burdened by farmers, that it is shared across the community and that when there is a uh, proposition put forward, that it benefits everybody. Now, we have a lot of farmers who rely on gas uh, and we have plenty of gas, uh, but state governments, particularly here in Victoria, are against gas exploration. They want to reduce consumption dramatically. What could that mean for farmers? Well, like a lot of sectors, uh, agriculture, especially the intensive horticulture sector, uh, flowers especially, rely on a lot of gas consumption for the warming of these um, their glasshouses. Now, a transition to an electrified system means that they're going to have to change their investment. They're going to have to change the way that they um, are competitive in a very um, slim margin market. So if there is any change away from gas, we have to make sure that government's putting in place incentives or assistance for those farmers to change their production systems because it is a very expensive uh, methodology, methodology to change your core fuel source. Gas is, has and will be a, an important part to play in agriculture for a fair while. And for us, assistance needs, assistance needs to be given 
for us to transition to any other fuel source, noting that it will take time and money to get there. Now, finally, a lot of Australian farmers are very happy with the Labor government's firm stance on the EU free trade agreement. Uh, what are the chances now that we're going to strike an advantageous agreement with the EU? Well, for starters, we do have our barneys with government. There's no doubt about it that we don't agree on everything. But this is one that we absolutely do. We've backed um, our trade minister, Minister Farrell, completely with his decision to make sure that he's trying to get the, the best deal he can for farmers and noting that there were sectors in this agreement that would have benefited, but agriculture would have gone backwards. There was nothing new on the table for us. It wouldn't have benefited any of the key commodities that we look to export into a very lucrative market and also noting that Australian produce could never fulfil the full demand. So to have a minister stand up for us, we're very excited by. We're also very um, heartened by the fact that we can put aside our differences, focus on the outcome and ask for what exactly our competitors are getting. What is New Zealand getting? What's Canada getting? What's South America getting? That's what we've been asking for in this deal. And Minister Fowle stuck by us and walked away from a deal that wasn't delivering what we needed. David Johinke, thank you so much for your time tonight. Up next, International Panel joins me to discuss the latest on Israel and Kamala Harris's bizarre warning amid the conflict. Oh dear. Welcome back. This week, all of Australia's living prime ministers, except one, Paul Keating, expressed support for Israel and called for solidarity with Jewish Australians in a rare joint statement. However, not everyone was on board. Former Labor PM Paul Keating didn't sign the letter, prompting coalition leader in the Senate, Simon Birmingham, to say he is disappointed. It's a reminder of uh, some of the differences we're seeing on the Labor side, and it's deeply unfortunate because at present we need everybody to be firmly reminded of the genesis of these attacks, and that is, of course, Hamas, a terrorist organisation on October 7, killing more Jews in a single day than at any time since the Holocaust. Joining me to discuss this and much more is our international panel for the night. I'm joined by Sky News contributor Kosha Gator and former Labor MP Michael Danby. Welcome to the program. Michael, Labor's problems uh, don't start or end with Keating when it comes to Israel and his uh, failure to sign this letter. Tell me about the divisions within Labor when it comes to Israel and, and why there's a reluctance to fully back our ally. Rita, you'll never hear this on the ABC, but there's been a fundamental shift in the nature of the Labor Party since Albanese came to power. Um, with the demise of Bill Shorten after two terms, the Labor right is in demise, and uh, the socialist left under any previous decade would never have had both the, uh, the Prime Minister and uh, Foreign Minister. So that's the power shift that's gone on. Now, of course, um, uh, Paul Keating is a, a cranky old dude who uh, got stuck into that AUKUS um, submarine deal, remember in that extraordinary mm. National Press Club speech, so that I think put him to the side. But there is a uh, ideological shift in the Labor Party which is much less sympathetic to our traditional allies, especially uh, Israel. Kosha, Simon Birmingham has also said it's disappointing that Anthony Albanese hasn't spoken yet with the Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, I don't think that's uh, accidental. There's probably a reason why Bibi isn't taking Albo's calls. Yep, nothing is accidental, Rita. Great to be with you as always. I think it's just a continuation of what Michael said, that there has been a real shift in the electorate in the left in Australia and other countries as well. And now they have to kind of walk this tightrope of either going with what the traditional position is or, you know, what seems to, to many to be a very low bar of, of basic things to be able to call the prime minister of Israel in the wake of these atrocities that happened and uh, even lending high level symbolic diplomatic support shouldn't be controversial. Yet it is because when you've got four, five, six percent of your electorate that uh, is sympathetic to the other side or doesn't want that, that's sort of the, the balancing act that we're going to increasingly see. And I think that undergirds why the prime minister hasn't made that phone call. 
And it can just be a numbers game there uh, because uh, we've got, what, eight times more uh, voters who are Muslim than who are Jewish. And, and, and there is a concentration in certain Labor seats. Now, The Age and The Sydney Morning Herald have been slammed for a news article in which Shani Lok, who was murdered by Hamas in the October 7 attack, was said to have been, and I quote, caught in the crossfire. Michael, Hacken being brutally hunted, murdered and then paraded through the streets by a pack of terrorists be interpreted as or described as caught in the crossfire? It can't. And like the New York Times, uh, they should apologise. Depraved. Depraved mass rape of women is the civilizational challenge of, uh, of that uh, October 7 mass slaughter in Israel. That's why so many people around the world understand that this is a bigger issue than just the usual Israeli-Palestinian stoush. If they can do it there, these people will try and do it elsewhere. And I'm very afraid of the ASIO Director General's warning that there are uh, chances of uh, spontaneous and opportunistic attacks here in Australia. If the coppers let people get away with what they're doing everywhere, these people are empowered and they'll start violently attacking people here in Australia. I warn them. Kosher, are you shocked by the reaction from certain segments in academia, media, the general commentariat with this conflict? Uh, the, the, the hatred and dismissal of, of the anti-Semitism that we're seeing, the, the, the almost dehumanising of the Israeli people. I, I mean, it is shocking to see, particularly when you look at some of the statements made by Ivy League colleges in America, respected academics who, who have just, uh, I don't know, laying bare their, their virulent anti-Semitism. You know, it's true. On, I would say it's both that on one level, sadly, I'm not surprised. It goes back again to that shift in the electorate and demographic that then trickles through into all institutions. And you look at uh, the backgrounds of some of the people that are in there and it might you know, start to reveal the answer. What I am surprised by is how uh, overt it's become and how much it's sort of bubbled up to the surface mm -hmm. and it's so much more visible. That's definitely palpable and that I think has been quite shocking to a lot of people to see. If there's one silver lining in this whole mess, it is that I think more people are paying attention to the insidiousness of the media or to these statements that have come out of Ivy, Ivy Leagues, and you're seeing a little bit more of a corrective force coming out with prominent donors closing checkbooks, journalists getting benched or mm. even suspended. Um, some people are a little bit disappointed that those same people didn't do that five years ago, 10 years ago, when these same institutions were also doing similar things for different issues. But hey, whatever the issue is, it wakes up more people. That's probably a silver lining that we can be grateful for. Because it never stops at universities. We thought for a period it did, that they went into the real world, that these uh, weird ideas would be defeated. But no, those weird ideas are taken and then they take hold in the corporate world. Now to the Russian region of Dagestan, where a lynch mob stormed the airport in search of Jews to attack. We brought you that shopping story last night. Uh, we also have learned that another mob formed in front of a hotel in Dagestan after a rumour was spread that Jews were staying at the property. The crowd checked every room of the hotel, demanding to see the passports of the guests. Michael, this is just scary, scary stuff. And we know Dagestan, it's, it's a devoutly Muslim area um, and some of the scenes at the airport... Again, to call it, it was described as a protest in some of the publications like Washington Post and AP. It was not a protest. It was much more like a lynch mob. Western authorities don't seem to understand that people standing in Collins Place yesterday and the Dagestan thing are all seen together on TV. So people are scared to go to Collins Place. People are scared to go to public places because they see the authorities letting uh, these mobs get away with this kind of behaviour. And until, you know, wake up Jacinta Allen, please. You know, we're going to have some violence happen in Australia here unless you stop people um, dominating public places who are a bunch of extremist jihadists. Now, Kosha, let's have a look at US Vice President Kamala Harris, who was asked about what she would say to Iran. This is what she had to say.
And what's the message to Iran? Don't. As President Biden said, just don't. Exactly. One word. Pretty straightforward. Kosha, is that a uh, compelling and powerful message? <laughs> No, I will say that, you know, very short speeches have been some of the most iconic in history. Winston Churchill, in his first address, comes to mind when he was asked, what is the aim? And he says, one word, victory. Or Ronald Reagan, you know, tear down this wall. That was five words in the iconic 1987 speech in Berlin. This is not that. It has to come attached with a certain level of gravitas. And of course, the bigger thing beneath the words and the, the weak messaging is, what is the policy position when she says that or when President Biden said that about Hezbollah? Are they intimating that we're getting ready to send endless funding and troops on the ground? Are they saying they're going to change their policy on funding both sides of the war and the $6 billion that went to Iran and everything that flowed out of that? Uh, it sets that thing up. But I think, you know, she, she got the memo to keep her speeches short, and maybe that's better than what the alternative might have been. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Michael, I mean, these, they're spot nations, uh, the, the mad mullahs of Iran, they don't respond to weakness. You've got to show strength. And the Biden White House doesn't portray strength. Well, they certainly don't read it. They sent the two carrier groups there, which may be temporarily restraining Hezbollah and Iran, but um, it's the weakness over the last two years of the Biden administration towards Iran that has brought us to this day. Uh, and, and, you know, they're all linked together. There's a Hamas fanatic in Jordan who's celebrating the fact that Hamas is showing Russia, China and Iran um, how to, mm. to destroy the West. And uh, this is the civilizational challenge of October 7. It's all linked. Michael Danby, Kosher Gator, thank you so much for your time this evening. Don't go anywhere. Pauline Hanson is up next. Welcome back. Well, you would have thought that given Australia faces a full-blown rental and housing crisis, that the government wouldn't be ramping up immigration to record highs. Well, think again, over the past year, more than half a million migrants have arrived in Australia, which is, according to former RBA economist Paul Bloxham, adding to inflationary pressures and, by extension, adding to interest rate pressures. Joining me to discuss this is a woman who has been calling for a rethink of the Big Australia policy for decades now, One Nation leader and Senator Pauline Hanson. Pauline, welcome to the program. <laughs> Why is this government you, so hooked on migration? Because it props up the economy. That's what it's all about. And you've got the Business Council of Australia also calling for higher immigration. You've got the Harvey Normans calling for higher immigration because they're selling more product to the Australian people. Um, you know, selling more product, more migrants coming in here. But as I've said for Rita, since 1996, when I spoke about immigration into the country, you've got to do it in a well-managed, balanced way so we have the infrastructure in place to, to deal with it. Governments and politicians Lose, have lost touch with grassroots Australians who are struggling to own their own home. They, you've got 100 that line up if a rental accommodation comes up for rent. There's mm. about 100 people lining up for it. You've got high... The, the, the prices of houses. Banks are making more money out of it because they're loaning more loans to, you know, higher... Um, loans to people. You've got state governments, they're reaping all the benefits from the stamp duty. This is benefits to governments and to big business, but it's not helping the Australian people, their way of life, their standard of living, and governments keep doing it. But I, And Barry Jones said this years ago, in, in the early 90s, he said, Labor brings in people into the country also purely for the vote. They know it will cause social cohesion, in cohesion with the, with the community. They don't care. They don't care, Rita. And people out mm. there, they know. But you know what? They keep voting for the same old ones. They keep voting for Labor and they keep voting for Liberals who are the same with high immigration. Not as high as Labor. Labor are worse at this than, um, than the Libs. But with high immigration, even international students, over 100,000 more have come in in the last 12 months than the previous 12 months, over 225,000. But also, Rita, they take up 70% of new dwellings. 70% of, mm. of new dwellings goes to foreign students. 
Well, we know about the pressure on, on infrastructure, whether we're talking about roads, public transport, hospital waiting lists, but it seems housing has become the really critical factor here because we're just not keeping up yeah. with the new dwellings needed to house all these people coming in. Uh, what's going to be the impact of that? Obviously, yeah. rents are going to go up and property prices are going to go up further. But, but is there any sort of a, I don't know, solution? Is, does the Albanese government have a plan to build sufficiently or at least uh, loosen regulations so developers uh, are encouraged to build more? Their plan was a $10 billion um, fund that they put up there and, and to spend um, interest rate, interest from the fund into new housing of 30,000 houses over the next five years. You, we haven't got the tradies to build it. You can't get the supplies. You can't get, you know, what you need. Um, that's a big problem as well. The thing is, for every 1,000 migrants you have, they require about 550 homes. Where are the homes for the Australians out there? That's why there's a lot of couch surfing. That's a lot, why a lot of people live in their caravans, their cars, in parks, in tents. And this is ridiculous. Albanese and Labor government are not concerned about the Australian people and how tough they are doing it. All he's worried about bringing in more migrants, prop up the economy with the GDP, that's what it's about. And I think it's disgusting of any Prime Minister of this country to disregard the Australian people and how tough they are doing it purely because he wants to play on the world stage. Now, we did have the essential poll out today and it did show, it is a left-leaning poll, but it did show Labor's uh, primary vote down, Greens down fairly dramatically, Coalition up a little bit and One Nation was up. Uh, it, are you sensing a shift in, in the mood of the nation after the <coughs> referendum? Most definitely. People have actually woken up to the referendum, what has actually happened. So they're not blinded now and they're questioning where has the money gone, where are the results, there are no results. And they feel they have been deceived by the Prime Minister and the Labor Party. They want answers to the questions. Like I said, the cost of living is the main issue of you know, Australians are talking about. And they shake their heads when they see this government spent $400 million on this referendum that went nowhere, and now he's turning around and saying, well, we may legislate for rural and regional areas the same policy that was, that was just thrown out on its ear by the people of Australia. People want mm. truth and honesty from their politicians. They want true representation. Why it's with One Nation is because they're starting to look at One Nation as a party that really cares about this country and the people, first and foremost, before international interest and multinationals. You know, the Liberal Party need to get their act together because they're being taken over by the moderates and they're more to the leaning to the left to pick up those moderate votes. Where we, we are the true Conservative. You know, common sense policies and people are starting to see that. But people must, you know, people have to take the, the blame themselves. When they go to vote, a lot of them don't understand the preference system. They are of the opinion they must vote either Liberal or Labor. They, and you don't have to. Vote for the minor independent parties and vote for one nation. That's where you'll get true representation. Now, Pauline, before you go, I've only got 20 seconds, but tell me about your Christmas gin and what it supports. Oh, it supports cartoons. Rita, you see them as a hoot, and thank you for your support. And so I do a lot them. of Australians. It informs, it informs Australians about politics, these characters, who they are, what they stand for, these politicians, the gutless wonders in our parliament. But we're informing the people. We're keeping them up to date, and a lot more people have become more interested in politics because of our cartoons. And uh, good, that's great. Absolutely. If we're doing that, that's what I, it's all I, about. So the, the buying the gin... It goes to the cartoons. <laughs> Yep, I play those cartoons every Friday night because it is the best satirical cartoon series I think this country's ever produced. It's funny, it's worth it. Pauline Hanson, thank you so much for your time and thank you for your company tonight. Don't go anywhere. The Bolt Report is up next. Thank you.